Welcome to Bible Insights with Wayne Conrad. God's Word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Hebrews 13 and verse 7 says, Remember your leaders who have spoken God's Word to you. As you carefully observe the outcome of their lives, imitate their faith. Today's topic are God's key agents in the Protestant Reformation. Actually, I'm going to talk about the first generation of the Reformers. That is, the four men who are basically contemporaneous with one another and who at the same time are leading movements of reformation in their respective areas by the hand of God. Now, the first one is actually someone who lays a foundation And so these are the men I want to talk about today. The first is Erasmus. He was a humanist. And he was a great agent in the Renaissance. And what he did was to produce the New Testament in Greek. You see, up until this time, the people had been using the New Testament in Latin the Vulgate. But he restores the New Testament to the language in which it was originally written in, Greek. So he produces the Bible in Greek. And it's the study of this Greek New Testament that greatly impacts the first three generation reformers. In fact, they encounter the redeeming, saving God through the reading of this text of Scripture. And so he greatly influences the Reformation in this way. Now, the truth of the matter is that Erasmus never became a Protestant reformer. He never joined officially into the Protestant movement. In fact, as time went along, there was a break between him and Luther, and it's demonstrated in the respective writings that they had. Erasmus wrote on free will, and Luther responded to the bondage of the will. But the Bible that Erasmus printed in Greek resulted in the translation of the scriptures into the German language by Luther and to the English language by Tyndall. Now later, this will also be used in the translation into other languages. But these are the first two in the big first wave of the Reformation. You see, Erasmus wanted the church to be reformed, but he wanted to be reformed ethically and morally. He wanted to clean up the corruption, but he didn't want to really touch the liturgy or the doctrine of the church. So he remained a Roman Catholic. He did not join in with the Protestant movement directly. And yet his role is inestimable in laying the groundwork for the Protestant Reformation. It's also interesting that the three reformers that I'm going to discuss today were all directly influenced and even knew Erasmus personally. Tyndall, who produces the Bible in English based on this Greek translation of the New Testament, had Erasmus as his Greek teacher. Luther and Erasmus personally knew one another, and they wrote wrote many letters back and forth to one another. And also Zwingli was well aware of Erasmus and had personal contact with him as well. In fact, he liked Erasmus a lot. And so Erasmus, although he doesn't become a Protestant reformer, actually grants us the tool by which the other three reformers restore to us the Bible in the common language of the people. You can never underestimate how God may use unbelievers or those who we might say are close to believing but refuse to come all the way, such as Erasmus. In the providence of God, Erasmus is a key player in the Protestant Reformation. The second person I want to introduce you to is Martin Luther. Now, many of us have heard of Martin Luther, and so 
He may be familiar to you already, but there's a scripture that forms the foundation of his theological contribution as he came to understand the meaning of Romans 1.17, which speaks about the righteousness of God. At first, he was terrified by that verse because he only read about the righteousness of God and immediately thought of God as our judge. But after he, he was studying the Greek New Testament and he comes across Romans 1.17, one day the Holy Spirit opens up his eyes to see the rest of the verse. The righteousness of God that's received through faith. This revolutionized his life. In fact, it led to his own personal conversion. So his great contribution theologically was in the development and the doctrine of justification by faith alone in Christ alone, based on the testimony of the Scripture alone. So he took the Greek New Testament produced by Rasmus and he translated it into German. This was why I was in hiding in the castle after the trial at Worms. There for six months, he translates the New Testament from the Greek into the German language. And in so doing, he restores the Bible to the German people. He also greatly influences modern German language. He had great contribution to make to the society as well as to theology. He also impacts the worship of the church in Reformation. He did, so this, he did this by the production of hymns that he wrote in the language of the people. So he wrote hymns in German. He utilized hymns that teaches the great doctrines that he was uncovering in the Scripture. And so when you read those hymns, many of them are based on paraphrases of the Psalms, you receive the doctrine of the Protestant Reformation, of salvation, for instance, by grace, through Christ alone, received by faith alone, based on the scriptures. One such hymn is salvation unto us has come. So Luther uses hymns in great theological content, given in singable tunes, and they had great effectiveness in spreading the evangelical faith. Another innovation that he did, did was to take the basic teachings, such as the Apostles' Creed and the Lord's Prayer and the Ten Commandments and produce simple catechisms for the instruction in the faith. He produced ones for the younger ones and he produced ones for those more mature the larger catechism and shorter catechisms of Luther. They had great influence in spreading the faith. And these become models for other reformers down the line who also produced catechisms and many also contributed to hymnody. The third man that I want to introduce you to is Jurek Zwingli in Switzerland. And he began the Reformation there on January 1st 1519. In fact, there's some that say that is the beginning of the Reformation because Luther lit the spark on October 31st, 1517, but he at that point had not yet developed fully into what we would call a Protestant. At that time, he was still very much a Catholic who wanted to clean up the indulgence activity of the church. And he had began to approach an understanding of the gospel. And he knew that the treasure of the gospel was there, but it was later that he fully embraced it. And so there's that dispute. Should we celebrate October 31st, 1517, or January 1st, 1519? But he began a reformation by a radical approach to preaching. From his own study of the New Testament, he became convinced that the people needed systematic instruction in the text of Scripture. And so his major contribution to Christian worship was to restore, to restore preaching as the central act in the public worship of the gathered people of God. And he introduced a concept of preaching through the books of the Bible continuously. 
And so this greatly influences the Reformation, and it restores preaching to a central place in the instruction of the people in the public worship of God. And so after he began this, he continued it throughout the rest of his preaching ministry. For 12 years, he contributed to the Reformation before he was tragically killed. But he alternated his preaching consistently through the Gospels and the Epistles in an alternating fashion. Today, we call this expository preaching. So he restored preaching to its central place in the church using the continuous preaching through books of the Bible with applications to the people in the church. He was following such exhortations as 1 Timothy 4.13, give attention to the public reading of the scripture and to the exhortation that Paul gives to Timothy to preach the word. So the exposition of the word of God in the power of the Holy Spirit is a principal way in which we encounter God. We encounter him through the word proclaimed in the assembly of the people, that is, the congregation. And the fourth person I want to mention to you today is William Tyndall in England. Now, all of these men were contemporaneous, and so the first wave of the Reformation is going on by all of them contributing at a continuous continuum of time, beginning with Erasmus and his translation of the Bible into the Greek, restoring the Greek New Testament. Then we have Luther, and we have Zwingli, and then we have William Tyndall. Now, William Tyndall was a cleric engaged in private tutoring. He was a great scholar. He spoke several different languages. And his principal contribution to the Reformation was the translation of the Bible into the English language of the people of Great Britain. He studied Greek under Erasmus, so you can't get any more personal than that. His translation of the Bible into English greatly shaped the English language, and all subsequent translations lean heavily on his translation. The one that comes after it, the Great Bible and the Coverdale Bible, are almost identical to everything Tyndall did, except that Coverdale completed some of the Old Testament from the Hebrew that, that to Tyndall was not able to get to because of his martyrdom. Even the King James Version, which became the most popular, is totally relied for about 80% or more on the Tyndall translation of the Scripture. So Tyndall restored the Bible to the English-speaking world. His major theological contribution was to the concept of the church as the gathered assembly of of people. He stated that the church is composed of miserable sinners who are unforgiven. <laughs> and then he said, the church is composed of forgiven sinners. He's using the contrast of the fact that saints still sin. And saints are those who are sinners who are forgiven by the grace of God. So he sees the church as the community of faith. And his significant contribution then theologically is to his concept of the word of the church. He did not translate the word ecclesia as the church as everybody wanted it to be done. He translated it consistently as congregation. That is, the people who are gathered together under the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he used 1 John chapter 1 as a scripture to support his fact that the church is composed of forgiven sinners. And he believed the church is formed by the preaching of God's word. And his proof for this attribute of the church he quotes and looks to Romans 1.14, which says, How can they call on him 
whom, in whom they have not believed, and how can they believe without hearing about him, and how can they hear without a preacher? How can they hear without someone preaching to them? Romans 10, 14, not Hebrews. <laughs> Excuse me. So here we have these men. They're key figures in the Reformation of the 16th century, and all of them were principally engaged in this work in the 1520s and beyond. We owe a great debt to these great men of the faith. We should remember them, for though they being dead these many, many years, are still leaders who spoke to us the word of God, and in fact, who even restored the word of God to the church, and who enabled the church in its reform sector to become truly a people who are under the word of God, being shaped by the Holy Spirit using the living word of God in the lives of God's people to not only bring them to faith, but to sanctify them into the image of Christ Jesus. Father, we thank you. We thank you in your providence for bringing Erasmus to translate the Bible into Greek so that the reformers who followed him can have the Bible in its original language based on those early, early manuscripts. And through their teaching of your word can bring about such transformation that we have restored to us the great truth that we are saved by your grace alone, justified in Christ Jesus our Lord through our personal faith in him, grounded upon the testimony to Christ that's found in your sacred word. We thank you for these leaders of the past and for our leaders today who speak the word of God to us. May we consider their way of life and imitate their faith to the glory of the name of Jesus Christ. This has been Wayne Conrad with Bible Insights. <laughs>